The following is a presentation of Nachi Creek Baptist Church in Madisonville, Tennessee. For more information, please visit nachicreekbaptist.org.
certainly is good to be in the house of God. Just thank God for this opportunity to be before you this morning. Uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, it's been just a little while, but uh, no doubt many familiar faces, people that we know and love, and uh, hope you feel the same way about us. Amen. Um, this morning, uh, God laid a message on my heart. I tell you what, I believe He's already uh, been moving and dealing. Uh, uh, things have already come to pass as uh, God laid on my heart uh, for us to move closer to the altar, to find out where the altar of God truly is in our life. And that's what the message relates around this morning. And I believe God is already moving and dealing. If you have your Bibles, we've, uh, we'll start with the verse of Scripture in 1 John. And move from there as you're uh, turning and looking in your, your Bibles. Um, had a story that I heard that uh, relates to all this, or to me it related to all this, and I want to share it with you. I was driving down the road this week, and there was a, a gentleman come on the radio, and he said uh, there was a, a flight that was scheduled to, to leave out of uh, Nashville and um, going, going west. And... Uh, as the plane was loaded, and some of you, I'm sure, have been on planes. I've been on one a time or two. And as you know, the conditions aren't the most comfortable that you'll ever experience. Uh, and so as they loaded and packed the plane in, some 100, 150 people, uh, they were buttoning down the straps, getting ready to take off. And, and uh, as the story goes, this woman had a, I would say he was about a four-year-old boy with her, and he just didn't want to go. And as children sometimes do, he made a scene. Uh, and he didn't just say, speak his peace and go on. Of course, he kept speaking his peace, and some of you parents probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, he went on and on and carried on and uh, was crying and pitching a tantrum, and, uh, and the pastures began to become restless. Uh, after 15 minutes or so, and they were getting ready to take off, but after 15, 20 minutes of this, uh, a gentleman in uniform uh, from the, towards the front of the plane stands up. As he stands up uh, and he turns around, the people in the cab notice he's got uh, uh, a military uniform on and he's well decorated, lots of medals and ribbons and things of that nature. And uh, he, he begins to just... Uh, casually make his way back to where the mother and child were. Uh, and as he uh, approaches them, he gently leans across where the mother's sitting to where the, the young boy is and gently whispers in his ear. And immediately, the child's disposition changed, uh, the crying stopped, and he just sat there content with the situation. And to everyone's relief, there was a great applause, you know, and everybody was happy that this had happened. And the man uh, just turns around and goes back to his seat. Just as he's beginning to, to sit down, the man beside him says, Sir, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you what words of wisdom, what wise words you spoke to that young child that would cause him uh, to quit crying. And he said, Well, he said, I, I told him, uh, that I was in the military and I asked him if he'd seen all these medals and decorations that I had and asked him what those meant, what they stood for. And of course, being a young child, he didn't know. So I went on to tell him that those medals and decorations were given to me uh, in the situation that I were to come upon an unruly passenger that on each flight I was allowed to throw one person off. And that I didn't really want to, but I would take my duty up if necessary. Well, the man beside him just was astounded, didn't know what to say. Um, and of course, I say that in humor, but uh, you know, as I heard that story this week, I, I related to that and thought to myself, my, my, how easy with great authority it would be to so easily throw one to the side, cast one away, uh, to have the ability to 
to determine one's fate and yet be long-suffering and show mercy and grace. And I thought of our God. I thought of how gracious He is, how loving He is, how He hasn't just thrown us away, but that there's something in that that's precious and something that I'm afraid that we often take for granted. This morning, with a verse of Scripture, 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, I want to talk about something this morning. I want to talk about something this morning that we so easily seem to take for granted. Something that we so easily seem to cast aside. I had all of you turn, but I didn't turn. How about that? He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's read that one more time. Little children... Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Brother Gail, would you lead us as we go to the Lord in word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, God, you are so uh, wonderful this morning. God, you have already moved upon this place. And uh, God, we pray that in our hearts and lives that we uh, would bow ourselves down at this point in time, God, that we would humble ourselves before you, that you might uh, be given preeminence, God, that you might be given your rightful place this morning among us, God. Uh, we claim not a, nothing of our own power, but uh, God, we pray that in demonstration and power of your Holy Spirit that your word would be preached this morning, that uh, hearts would be moved, God, that uh, we would uh, uh, know where we stand before you, God, and that uh, we would see your great love and mercy towards us. In Christ's name we pray for all these things. Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning, friend, I uh, want to uh, speak to you and preach just for a few minutes on this. Uh, on the subject of idolatry. Um, you know, and we have a broad term for that, no doubt, but uh, here in 1 John, he says, little children, keep yourselves uh, from idols. Uh, uh, don't be caught in idolatry. In another uh, scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 14, he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Uh, we find that uh, this idolatry, this is uh, uh, something that God takes seriously. It's something that's serious business before God. Uh, and I'm afraid uh, it's uh, something that we have, uh, I guess, gotten uh, misinterpreted. something that uh, we've looked at, uh, I'm afraid, in the long light al along the way. Uh, I want to look just for a minute, if you were to uh, pull the dictionary out, which uh, I, I know that uh, not everybody carries one in their pocket, but if you were to pull that one out of your pocket right now and uh, to look it up, uh, it would simply say this, that uh, idolatry is, or an idol is an image used, as an object of worship or a false god. It is one that is adored often blindly or excessively, uh, something visible but without substance. Uh, uh, friend, this morning, that's what we're going to talk about for a little while. Uh, uh, if you look in the Scriptures in Exodus chapter 20, uh, it begins very early in Scripture that God lays down a map before His people that He doesn't want any gods before Him, that He doesn't want any idols, anything that uh, would come before Him, anything that would uh, separate His people from Him. And, uh, and He began early to, uh, to lay that format out and, and to... And to show them that in, uh, in the New Testament, in the book of James, it speaks of how uh, the Scriptures say that uh, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusts to envy. Uh, friend, that God desires us, that uh, God doesn't want us to uh, partake in anything that would uh, take us away from Him or take uh, the attention that He so rightly deserves in putting on another object or uh, another affection. And uh, uh, there's a place in Corinthians that I want to read with you. Uh, if I might paraphrase it just simply, he says in uh, Colossians chapter 3, excuse me, that uh, this is why we must kill everything that belongs uh, that belongs only to the earthly life, to uh, all the fornications, the impurities, the, uh, the guilty passions, the evil desires, and especially the greed, uh, which is the same thing as worshiping a uh, false god, and that all this sorts of behavior that 
that it makes God angry, that God says cast it away, that, uh, that He doesn't want it before Him, that, uh, that it's not something that He wants to be uh, mentioned among His people. And, uh, and I wanted to share with you a story, a story that uh, many of you uh, probably already know, but this is where uh, most of our uh, sermon this morning is based from and comes from. Uh, it's a story of uh, the king of Judah, King Ahaz this morning is who uh, we like to speak on just for a moment. And, uh, and I was doing some reading this week and as I was reading this uh, passage of Scripture just uh, bluntly seemed to hit me in the face. And, and I'd heard a, a message preached on Ahaz not long ago, but uh, the message didn't necessarily uh, pertain to what uh, the Lord brought to my attention for uh, this morning. If uh, you look at the life of Ahaz in the book of 2 Kings chapter uh, 16, and if you'd like to turn your Bibles there, uh, we'll be spending uh, a great majority of our time right there uh, this morning in the book of 2 Kings chapter 16. The Bible tells the story of Ahaz, how uh, he began to rule over Judah. And, and as uh, the situation uh, might be, I'll uh, give you just a little background on uh, King Ahaz. It, it's uh, said that before his time there was uh, much idol worship and that after his time there was much idol worship, but during his time uh, there were some things that, uh, that went on that uh, really caught our attention and uh, some things that I believe need to be uh, brought out to us this morning. Uh, uh, if you look in 2 Kings chapter 16, you'll find that uh, he was a man that uh, gave himself over to a life of wickedness, yet uh, we find that he still worshipped uh, God or tried to worship God. Uh, we find a contradiction there. We find uh, something very strange, but uh, uh, something that uh, happened here that uh, was very peculiar, that uh, he chose to try to worship idols and he chose to try to worship God. Uh, and the Bible says that in verse number 4, if you want to look there and find it, that, uh, that he burned incense in high places, that he went and, uh, uh, and worshipped under the trees. And uh, all of these things, of course, pertain to idol worship, that uh, he found himself uh, with uh, the, heathens, uh, the heathens' gods. He found himself uh, offering sacrifices to them. He found himself uh, taking a position or a stance that was not pleasing to God. But it not only st uh, stops there, friend, but it goes on farther. The, uh, there's a situation that has moved about. Uh, scripture goes on to say in verse 5 that because he uh, had partook in idol worship, because he had tried to mingle the worship of God with the worship of idols, that uh, the anger of God was kindled against him, that, that God uh, moved to punish him, and that part of his punishment was uh, that he uh, would be uh, gone to war, that he would uh, be in conflict with uh, his brother Israel. He would be in conflict with uh, uh, the surrounding nations. So uh, the Bible says that uh, this king, uh, that King uh, Ahaz, the king of Judah, that uh, that wa that he was up against the the king of Aram and up against Judah, and that uh, he uh, felt that uh, as if he had no hope, that he had no end. Although that uh, the prophet of God Isaiah uh, had already told him that uh, he need not uh, uh, worry, that he need not. Uh, worry about it, that he need not take, uh, take matters into his own hands, that if he would follow God, that he would trust God, that uh, God would take care of him, that God would take care of uh, the situation. But uh, the king of uh, Judah, the king Ahaz here, uh, he chose to take matters into his own hands. Friend, uh, and listen to me as I say this. He chose to take matters into his own hands. Uh, the Bible says that uh, he went to the temple, that as he went to the temple, he took the, uh, the gold that uh, was in the temple. He took God's gold uh, uh, to the king of, of Assyria, the only man that he thought could help him, the only one uh, who he assumed could be his friend and that could be his ally in this situation. So he took the, the gold out of the temple. He took the gold out of his own personal treasury and uh, he bought friendship with the king of Assyria. And uh, of course, in his own eyes, the, uh, this worked. Uh, the Bible says that Assyria uh, went up against Aram and uh, Israel 
and that uh, kind of backed them off, that kind of uh, kept the heat off of the King Ahaz. And, and in doing so, King Ahaz was pleased. Uh, uh, the Bible says, uh, you, you, might, you might as well just uh, uh, paraphrase it if you want to, but uh, more or less it seems in verse 10 that this has worked and, and that as this has happened, then Ahaz goes to meet the king of Assyria. Uh, and he goes to uh, meet his Savior, so to speak, and then uh, he goes and, and com- uh, c- converses with him. Well, while he was there, things began to happen. Uh, a bad situation begins to get worse. As he is there, scriptures say that he's seen an altar. An altar that uh, was great in his eyes. An altar that uh, the Assyrians had. Uh, no doubt and great and powerful that the Assyrians are. Uh, they must have great gods. They must have uh, gods that uh, led them to this uh, great uh, victory, this great triumph. So uh, he takes and he has a sketch of this altar made. And he sends it back to Uriah, his, his priest, and uh, tells him that he wants an altar of this nature built for himself. And by the time he makes it back to his kingdom, the altar is ready. Scripture goes on to say in verse 12 that he loved it. He loved it in so much that he offered sacrifice on it. And he began to use it in worship of his gods. But the strange thing, the strange thing that came to our attention began to happen right here. If you look in verse 13, it speaks of how he mingled the ways of God with the ways of idolatry. It says that he took and uh, offered these offerings, and uh, if you read on down in Scripture, it tells you that he decided this was such a good thing that he went into the temple. He commanded that the brazen altar that Solomon had placed there in the temple, that it be moved. That it be moved to a different place. He decided that the altar of God didn't need to be in the highest place. He decided that it needed to be moved to the side so that this altar that he had brought in, this altar that he had conjured up of his own desire might be placed in the greatest, the greatest area of the temple. He wanted the altar, and if you'll look, as Scripture says, that he brought also the brazen altar which was before the Lord from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and he put it on the north side of the altar. It goes on to say that he now considered this altar that he'd had brought in, this altar that he'd had made to be the greater. He offered great sacrifice to it. He put it in the position of prominence and greatness. But the most peculiar thing, as you read on, is this. He says, but I will keep this brazen altar, I will keep this altar that Solomon has built and put in here. I will keep it and put it over here to the side and use it when I want it. Use it when I might need it for my guidance. Friend, that is our message to you here this morning. As I read that verse of Scripture, or speak of that verse of Scripture in your presence, how often is it, and God help us, how often is it that an altar to an idol has been placed in the position of prominence in the greatest area, the area that is most prominent in our life. And the altar of God has been put in the closet. It's been cast aside. It's not been done away with because we might need it one day. huh? It's not been thrown out completely because we might need it for a little guidance 
when we get in a bind. This was King Ahaz. This was his great sin. This is why he was considered a man of wickedness. A man that when he died, and his son Hezekiah came in, it says that he wasn't buried with the kings. He was buried in a different place. A man that it says that after he died, Hezekiah tried to remove the things, the ungodly things, from the temple. And it took him 16 days to remove all these ungodly things that he had brought into the temple. A life marked with woe. A life of disappointment, no doubt. I don't know if he is disappointed in himself, but as I read this, it saddens my heart. As I read this, I think of what John Wesleyan said concerning this very same verse of Scripture. He said, The great altar, this new altar, which was greater than Solomon's, sacrifice whatsoever is offered to the true God, either in my name, for possibly he did not yet utterly forsake God, but worshipped idols with him, or on behalf of the people, shall be offered on this new altar. This should be reserved for my proper use to inquire by, at which I may seek God or inquire at His will. By sacrifices joined with prayer, when I shall see fit. Where is the altar of God? And that's our question to you today. The question that beckons my own heart as I study this message. Where is the altar of God in my life? Is it in prominence? Is it right there, up front, where it ought to be? When things are going good, that I, I'm right there at the altar of God. When things are going bad, I'm right there at the altar of God. Day in and day out, I'm seeking God's face. Or is it kind of cast to the side? Is it kind of been put in a closet, put to the side, out of, out of sight, out of mind, as we oftentimes say? I'd like to ask them if they would to just come and prepare us a verse of invitation. Well, where, where is the altar of God in our lives? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of what Noah said in Jonah chapter, or excuse me, Jonah said in Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. He says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Another way you might say the same thing is this. They that cling to idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. They that cling to idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. That's what the writer is saying here. He says when we observe lying vanities... We're forfeiting. We're forsaking. Mercy. Things don't have to be that way. You know, I believe with all of my heart, if Ahaz had not chose to worship those idols, if Ahaz had not chose to bring that false altar in, things would have been different. I believe that. And things don't have to be the way they are just because that's the way they are right now. Things can change. Things can be different. But it takes us coming before God. And that's the good news I want to share with you as we stand to our feet in Ezekiel chapter 36. Speaking through the prophet, he says, When I sprinkle clean water upon you, you shall be clean. He says, For all your filthiness and all from all of your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you. A new spirit I will put in you. I will take away the stony heart out of flesh, and I'll give you a heart of, of flesh. 
I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. The very next chapter he says, Neither shall I shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned. And I will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. That's God's offer this morning. God says those idols, those false altars, if you're willing to put those things away, he said, I'm willing to cleanse you. He said, I'm willing to give you a heart of flesh in place of that heart of stone. I'm willing to make things right between me and you if you are willing to cast those idols aside. A.W. Tozer said this. He said that grace will save a man but it will not save him and his idols. And you think about that. That's deep right there. That's the message this morning. There is grace. Grace that can save. Grace abundant. Grace full and free. And it's for you. But it's not for the idols.